Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, February 12, and I'm Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on onespotmedia.com. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is expected to table a bill in the House of Representatives this afternoon to acquire Venezuela's 49% stake in Petrojam. Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith made the revelation at a media briefing this morning. She says the bill will not be debated today. Mrs. Johnson-Smith says the Jamaican government has written to PDV Caribe saying it remains open to negotiations. She says the compulsory acquisition is necessary to protect the country's energy security. The police have released the name of the woman charged in connection with the abduction of a baby from the Victoria Jubilee Hospital in Kingston. She is 28-year-old Peter Gay French. The woman was yesterday charged with child stealing after she was pointed out in an identification parade. No court date has been set. Ms. French, who is said to have suffered multiple miscarriages, was allegedly pregnant and went into the hospital on January 7 to have her baby. She, however, returned home on January 9 with a newborn. That's the same day the baby was abducted. The baby was returned to his parents on Friday after a DNA test confirmed his identity. French was arrested last Tuesday as she tried to register the baby at the Registrar General's department. Last week's deportation of 29 people from the United Kingdom to Jamaica has raised new concerns in the wake of the Windrush controversy. Originally, 50 persons were to be deported, but some were able to have their removal cancelled after their lawyers took action. Speaking on TVJ's Small Jamaica program on Tuesday, the British High Commissioner to Jamaica said this issue is nothing new. Where I think um, we get uh, un un a lot more attention than others, because there are countries in the region that send people here every month. Week weekly and in large numbers, but we do this once every 18 months or so and it's big news. And I think that talks about the fact that uh, people expect uh, us to have a slightly different kind of uh, engagement and in interaction and this comes as a bit of a, a, a sudden shock and, and a surprise. Mm -hmm. But th there's a very, very simple message. Whether you're in Jamaica or whether you're in the UK, obey the law because uh, if you steer clear of those, you have many other positive things to offer. Questions were raised about whether or not some of the deportees have ties to Jamaica. The British High Commissioner says his team is working to ensure that the deportees are integrated into the Jamaican society. We work with a, a local uh, private sector organization, a charity organization. We fund them. We have full-time staff there. The people come here with a small amount of money so that they can actually get themselves going. And we link them with basic things. How do you get a TRN? How do you get your ID sorted out? Uh, initial accommodation and, and the like. And then make that uh, link uh, work. Some people have family left behind and so we need to find ways in which they, they can communicate. The curfew that was imposed in sections of Central Village St. Catherine in the St. Catherine South Division has been extended. The curfew began at 6 p.m. on Saturday, February 9, and should have ended yesterday, but it will remain in effect until Wednesday, February 13. The boundaries of the curfew are north along Collins Crescent to Rocklands at the eastern boundary, east along Rocklands to the Nelson Mandela Highway in the vicinity of the dirt track, south along Nelson Mandela Highway from the dirt track at the eastern boundary to the Astrum Construction Company, west along the Astrum Construction Company to Collins Crescent at the northern boundary. During the hours of the curfew, all persons within the boundaries are required to remain within their premises unless authorized in writing by members of the security forces. There are more tire issues that professionals believe are creating hazards to motorists on our roads. On Monday, TVJ News highlighted that used tires with grooves recut into them were being sold to drivers, exposing them to greater dangers. While this is a major hazard, tire warehouse manager Rohan White says that's not the only danger. Another growing factor is that we need to educate our public as it relates to underinflation. Because oftentimes, for example, now you will have a nail in your tire, and each time that tire goes down, what happens is that the rim cores the tire, 
and each time you go to the gas station and pump it back up, what you're seeing physically is the face of the tire on the outside, not necessarily on the inside. And one day you're going to drive until you can't take any more and that tire goes. He is advising motorists to do their regular checks on their tire conditions, including air pressure. He is also suggesting a legislative review of laws governing the importation of used tires, as well as the sale of the used tires at tire shops. An urgent call this afternoon for the authorities to fix the Anon Town Bridge in Clarendon to make it safer for pedestrians, particularly young children who are reportedly increasing at risk because of speeding motorists. TVJ's Krista Campbell reports. The journey to and from school has become extremely dangerous for these little ones, and that's because of the state of the Anion Town Bridge in Clarendon. The students who attend the nearby infant and all-age school make the daily trek, dodging and sidestepping speeding traffic and the dangerous ledge they use as a sidewalk. It's a concern educators want the authorities to urgently address. There's no sidewalk for the kids to walk down there. And there used to be a rail on both sides of the bridge and accident caused both rails to be hit off the bridge and now there is nothing there for safety. It's a very horrific and frightening scene to see little school children who go to the Anian Town all day school using this bridge and whenever they see motor vehicles approaching, they have to be scampering and scurrying for their own safety. The people say motorists frequently collide on the bridge and that puts other road users, particularly pedestrians, at greater risk. They want their members of parliament, the education, youth and works ministers to all work together to address a problem they say affects them all too frequently. When contacted, the National Works Agency explained that although the bridge is structurally sound, it's a challenge keeping the rails from washing away during heavy rains and flooding because of bamboo and other debris which get washed away from upstream and lodge beneath the bridge. However, NAA communication manager Stephen Shaw says the agency is working on a permanent solution. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. Vendors at the Appleton Market in St. Elizabeth are concerned as years after its construction, the facility is yet to be in full operation. Though the market was never officially opened, some vendors still use it, while others refuse to ply their trade there because of its location. The vendors who operate in the market say they want it inspected. They claim that there is not enough space in the market to host 10 vendors and there needs to be an inspection. Efforts to contact the Sugar Transformation Unit, which funded the construction, was unsuccessful. Opposition leader Dr. Peter Phillips is claiming a direct link between the decline in the sugar industry and rising crime. Addressing the recent monthly meeting of the Manchester Chamber of Commerce, he pointed to Westmoreland as a case in point. Westmoreland's economy was basically centered on tourism and on sugar. Tourism remains, it's even growing a bit, but the collapse of sugar has meant that most of those, particularly young men, have found their way into illegal activities, mainly scamming and all the attendant conflicts generated by scamming. He says it's a problem that's preventing Jamaica from attracting more jobs in the ICT sector and stressed that the government needs a much bigger commitment to improving the resources in the education sector if it is to adequately address the issue. The World Bank's numbers, numbers admittedly drawn from the end of the 90s, early part of this century. World Bank numbers say 70% of the labor force, the workers in the country, have no certification. Inevitably, low educational levels mean low productivity in the sectors. Low productivity means low wages. 
Over 20 persons have been left homeless in neighboring communities in Ocheria, St. Anne, after fire destroyed their homes between Wednesday and Saturday of last week. The first fire took place on Wednesday in Milford. One of the occupants of the house, Tanaj Hamilton, who spoke with our news team, said efforts were made to save items but to no avail. Everybody ran, you know, try to grab little stuff and <laughs> trying to go inside of the house, but the fire that engulfed, we couldn't go inside. There was too much heat, too much fire. To be frank, i will be very appreciative if I was given, you know, some help with, because I have four kids, plus my neighbor has two as well, and, you know, back to school and all of that. All the papers were lost, you know, clothes, everything. On Saturday, the firefighters were again kept busy, this time in Parrytown, after a five-bedroom apartment was destroyed. Owner of the apartment, Andre Murphy, says he was operating his motor vehicle when he received the call about the fire. Why well, I just drive away less than 50 minutes and by me come up the hill. Me see a fire brigade truck come and me pull a fire road and gateway. And by me gateway, me come up and reach on the nice thing. When I'm bridging, tell me some my house are down. It's speed up and get truck in and come. Me come see everything burn out already. You, you pass up a fire truck? Yes, sir. Pan hill. Mm. Neil run all over gully. And when me come, me come see it flat, flat. Answers are again being sought this afternoon from Education Minister Ruel Reed as to why some individuals employed to the National Education Inspector at NEI have not yet been paid for work done in 2017. TVJ's Ashane Masters reports. Spokesman on Education Michael Stewart is questioning the rationale behind outstanding payments to persons employed to the National Education Inspector at NEI. Speaking with TVJ News last evening, Mr. Stewart said several persons, some of them retired principals, brought the matter to his attention seeking his intervention. He says efforts were made to get in touch with the Education Minister, but it proved futile. And I thought I would bring it to the media to let the country be aware of what is really happening to these hardworking, committed and dedicated persons who are giving human service to the education system and ask that the Minister of Education really intervenes and does something to these hardworking persons who have been working without pay, carrying out such a very important task. Mr. Stewart says that this has created anxiety, disappointment and frustration, especially in light of what's happening at Petrogem and other state-owned agencies. The monies could have been diverted, have been um, spent in, in other areas, and not being placed in education. They are also saying that the minister has been making a lot of pronouncements about programs in the schools and the spend, but the monies are not being forthcoming. However, in an interview Tuesday morning with TVJ News, Permanent Secretary in the Education Ministry, Dean Roy Bernard, said the outstanding balances owed to the inspectors up to December 2018 will be paid in short order. That is coming out of a meeting with the NEI principal finance officer and myself and in response to the a letter I received from a group of um, inspectors who had claims so outstanding fees. He also gave an explanation as to what could have led to the delay in payment. In payment. Well, the, the issue is that the, the fees are not paid before work is done. So typically the inspection is done, the reports are submitted and vetted, and once quality assured, as per contract, the fees are, are booked and processed for payment. So there may be some time delays in the system. You know, it's a, the, the Ministry of Education is the largest ministry. Uh, we have taken on two portfolios. The staff members um, that are hardworking remain the same in terms of numbers. So at times, they are pressures. Rashid Masters, TVJ News. In news overseas, congressional negotiators say they have reached an agreement in principle to avert a partial government shutdown at the end of this week. Details from the CNN. Days before the deadline for another partial government shutdown, a tentative deal. We reached an agreement in principle uh, between us on all on the uh, Homeland Security and the other six bills. The four lead lawmakers didn't give specifics on the settlement, but did admit some flexibility was needed from both parties. There's not a single one of us is going to get every single thing we want, 
but nobody died. But we're going to get what is best for the United States. President Trump was given the update shortly before taking the stage at a rally Monday night in Texas. They said that progress is being made with this committee. Just so you know, we're building the wall anyway. They say that progress. A source says the deal includes nearly $1.4 billion for physical barriers covering about 55 miles. A White House official says aides are digesting the details with nothing set in stone. But some people see this as a step in the right direction. It is very encouraging news for the country that they, they appear to be in, uh, in agreement in principle. Others don't. His call for a concrete wall or anything that resembles that should never happen, both because it's a waste of money, it'll be ineffective, and because the minute we do that, we're going to fundamentally change the notion of what America is. And in sports, Edwin Allen High track and field head coach Michael Dyke says a special precaution is being taken with star sprinter Kevona Davis for the 2019 season. Davis, who missed the World Under-20 Championships last year after ending her season early due to injury, ran the second leg on Edwin Allen's record-breaking Class 2 4x100 meters team at the Milo Western Relays at the weekend. The team, which also included Brandy Hall, Salisha Miles, and Bethany Bridge, smashed the previous record of 45 seconds flat, clocking 43.94 seconds. Cheers. So we ensure that she has recovered fully from any injury or anything that was bugging her. And right now she's fully healthy and will be a chance performing at her best. And that's the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.